Hey health junkies, Dr. Krause here. Just wanted to jump in and let you know about a new feature that I'm adding to the podcast. It's the ability to ask me questions. I've had a ton of folks tell me that they would love for me to cover their questions on the podcast, so I'm going to do it. So each week I will be adding a couple of questions that I'm going to answer to each of the podcasts. And if it's a juicy enough question, I just may dedicate a whole podcast to it. So if you're interested in asking a question, head on over to my website at drjkrausnd.com. Check out a blue button on the right-hand side that says Ask a Podcast Question. Hit me up there. Or you can also access the button through my podcast notes also on my website. So head on over there, ask me some questions. I look forward to answering them soon. All right, let's get on with the podcast. Hey, health junkies. It's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Kraus, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Kraus, and today's episode is all about how spices can keep stress from killing you. So what is this all about? Well, spices, things like turmeric, things like green tea, which maybe is more like a tea, but technically it is high in phytonutrient content. That means it has lots of abilities to help shut down the inflammatory process that's occurring in your body to slowly kill you. Sounds drastic, but unfortunately it is kind of this main factor that happens to us as we get older. And today I'm going to go through a series of of stories in terms of what I've seen in my practice and the two different manifestations in terms of what happens when someone's younger and what happens by the time they gain 20 years on them in terms of the degradation of the body. Um, It's crazy. It's crazy to see and... I've been in practice over a decade now, and I'm starting to see patterns more and starting to really get worried about my folks and how they manage with stress, and of course about myself, as I've shared in other podcasts, because it seems to be one of the number one factors that determine how well we age. And if we're not dealing with stress well mentally, then we're not dealing well with stress physically. Because I think for a lot of us, we think of stress as things that bother us, but we don't really realize what's happening on a physiological level on our cells and what what the damage is to our cells from stress. Now, in previous podcasts, I've talked about how stress causes your blood sugar to go up, meaning cortisol levels. And I'm not demonizing cortisol. It's not a bad hormone. It helps us to wake up and go to sleep. And it does help us to legitimately get away from a threat. And that's important. We want that to happen. But if we're so fatigued because we're in a state of fight or flight all the time, if a bear actually does chase us, can we actually get away from it? In some cases, I wonder about some of my folks who have pushed themselves to the limits. So he recently went to a conference taught by the famous herbalist Lee Carroll, and he had this amazing funnel diagram that pretty much summed up the development of disease and and aging. So the development of chronic illness, the development of why it takes us 20 to 30 years on average to go from simple signs of illness to major chronic disease. And the unifying factors that take simple symptoms that we have every day that we kind of brush off and think, oh, that's just part of life, that really turn into something big and cause us to age fast, actually have a lot to do with our lifestyle. And yes, we know there's certain lifestyle factors and choices that are bad. We know drinking in excess is not a good thing. We know that smoking is not a good thing. But do we really know that surviving in a stressful state is a bad thing? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, duh, yeah, I know it's bad to be stressed out. But I thrive in a fight or flight environment. I thrive under pressure. I don't know if anyone really does thrive under pressure. Maybe in the moment, but later, what what are they doing to recover from that? 
I think a lot of us in the American population in particular have this inherent need to go, 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 do, 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 and push ourselves to the limits. Try to juggle everything. Try to go to every party. Try to show up at every social event while juggling kids, family, dinners, things of that nature. And I think we push ourselves for so long and then we just give up. And I'll explain that right now for a second. Because I will see ladies who are very successful in their careers, who have had children, who have now started to have to take care of their adult, well, obviously adults, but their aging parents. Um, And on top of that, they're just sick of cooking. They're sick of taking care of other folks. And so now they've decided they just don't want to cook anymore. And now their weight's starting to go up and their health's starting to decline. How did we get there? We got there because these individuals didn't take the time to relax, slow down, smell the roses, and literally just take breaks. Now, I have some presentations that I do throughout the community, and one of the big things I always talk to my folks about is the difference between being busy and being productive. And there's a huge difference between that. Because I think in the American society, we're considered weak if we can't juggle 8 million things and keep pushing on. We feel like someone's going to look at us and be like, oh, she's, she's not doing things right. She's not tough enough. Needs to keep going. Or he's not tough enough. He needs to keep pushing, pushing, going, going. I don't know what it is. But I've actually fallen into that too in, in the American thought process. I don't know if it's wanting to impress my peers or what, I, I do have that personality of go, 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 do, 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 drive, 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 push, push, push. And it's starting to freak me out because I'm looking at folks 20, 30 years down the line from me now and going, oh my gosh, I don't want to end up like that. That terrifies the daylights out of me. And I'm like, I've got to do something now. So this podcast is for everybody. But I'm really wanting folks who are in their 30s, their late 20s, mid-30s to late-30s to listen up. We've got 20 years or so, depending on how old you are, um, or 30 years, depending on how well you're balancing your stress, before your body starts to really show huge signs of decline. So take a moment to think about the simple signs that you have going on right now in terms of illness. And by that, I mean insomnia. This is one of my big things that I struggle with. Digestive issues, another big thing that's plagued me for most of my life. Stress management. And by that, I mean depressed, anxious, panic attacks, feeling overwhelmed. If this applies to you, any of those, you got you to gotta step back and be like, okay, I need to rethink this. Also, if you are a type A personality that wants to get things done, that's an that's a amazing individual who is driven. You set yourself up for this. And I'm not saying that every single person who is type A is going to end up aging not so well as they get into their 50s and 60s. I'm just saying that unfortunately because of that go, 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 do, 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 burn the midnight oil, I can tackle anything attitude, we sometimes forget to take care of ourselves. I don't know how it happens, but I find that so many folks, especially women, just can't seem to take care of themselves. Everyone else comes first. And and that's sad. So sad. So if you get nothing else out of this podcast today, it's at least that you've noted what simple things nag you right now. Whether it's being slightly overweight, whether it's aches and pains, whether it's depression, anxiety, panic attacks or whether it's your digestive system's off or you can't sleep. These are big issues. Don't ignore them. You want to get a handle on these because they're going to become bigger deals further down the line. All right, so let me tell you a little story here. Story time here on The Health Fix. So I've got a patient in my practice. She's 35 years old. And in the last month, it seems that her life has fallen apart for her. And not on a level of, you know, 
she's got a great support group. She's got a great boyfriend. She's got all of that there. She's got court great friends. But what's happening is she's got a headache every single day that's nagging her. She's had multiple panic attacks. She has had rashes on and off come forth on the body. And she fully admits to stress eating. She knows that she drinks a little bit more than she should. And now in the last week that I've seen her, her stomach started to burn with food. Well, most likely that's an ulcer. Where's, what's the number one cause of ulcer? Stress. Because we become stressed, we produce more acid in our body, we also lower our immune system. And really, it's more immune system lowering that I believe is the problem, counter to the conventional medical theory. Because if cortisol levels go up because you're feeling that that bear's after you, and by the way, that bear can be anything um, that's stressing you out, your cortisol levels, of course, go up. When cortisol goes up, it decreases your immune system. It's much like taking a bunch of hits of prednisone throughout the day. And if you know what prednisone is, it is a steroid medication that lowers the immunity. So your immune system does get compromised when you're on prednisone. And so we've got an individual who is is stressed day in, day out. And why she's stressed? She hates her job. And this is a very important factor for a lot of you out there to note. And I know it's easier said than done. But if you're doing something that doesn't fuel your passion, you don't love it, but you push and push and you try and you try, you're only killing yourself slowly. I highly recommend for a lot of folks who aren't loving their their job, you got to have a passion in life. Us driven folks who go, 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 do, 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 we'll try to push through anything, even if we hate it. And the sad reality is, is if you're not fueling your heart of what you really want to do, you just, you can't live that way. You're just going to crumble. And I see this often in my practice um, with patients. And I've seen it in my own practice because there has been times at which I'm seeing a lot of patients that I don't particularly enjoy the conditions I'm working with with them. And it kills you. It really wears you down and it, it crushes your soul. And to be honest with you, you have to look at life in terms of what makes you happy, what is fun for you. And if you don't know what is anymore, that's a, you got to go back to your childhood and think about it. So what I just talked to you about right now is that this patient of mine who is having the chronic headaches, who's not able to concentrate, who's extremely depressed to the point she's asked me for antidepressant medications because she feels like there's nothing else that's going to work because counseling doesn't seem to work. She's just feeling hopeless. This all stems from her not feeling fueled, not feeling challenged, not feeling passionate about her work. What set it all off? Trying to build a home with her boyfriend. Now, this seems weird, but think about the stressors and choosing certain things in a home and, and working with someone who, you know, her boyfriend is a great guy, but he's a little bit particular on what he wants, but she's also particular about what she wants. And so we've got a power struggle going on there. And that's what set her over the edge in the first place. However, the underlying, when you get to the basis of it, is she's 35 years old, she's bored out of her mind at work, and she's not feeling useful. All of us need to feel a purpose. And I think a lot of the reasons that folks push, push, push and do, do, do is they're feeling purposeful. And that's also why I think a lot of ladies, I don't know what it is about us. I think a lot of us like to juggle so many different things like family, our our aging parents, our, you know, multiple things in our social calendar and look like we are totally rocking the world because we're being purposeful. And I think that's why a lot of ladies don't take care of themselves either feel like their purpose, their mission is to take care of others. Okay, that's mine too. I love taking care of everybody. But if you aren't healthy, nobody else is going to get your wonderful benefits in life. So you got to take care of you first. Just like that old thing, put the oxygen on yourself first, then take care of the kids later on the plane. Keep that in mind. All right. So I've had my patient there who's in a 35 And life's kind of unraveling in terms of her health. She just can't seem to not have headaches. She can't seem to get the the 
pain in the in the stomach under control and so of course here I come in <clears throat> and I'm there to help to try to support but if you don't get rid of the original stressor whatever it is in life that's not working well for someone it's really hard you can throw as many herbs and foods and whatever you want at someone if the core problem is not taken care of you're what are you gonna do um things won't 100 percent change i mean say she has an ulcer i can get rid of the ulcer and heal that lining but if she keeps stressing herself out i can't that that lining of her gut is still going to have irritation that headache that she has every single day we've ruled out all of the other factors which by the way morning headaches oftentimes are a sign of stress because you might be clamping down with your jaw overnight they can also be a sign of not having enough oxygen while sleeping meaning sleep apnea especially in folks who start to gain weight as they're stress eating and and moving through the stressful period so keep that in mind but also it can be the adrenal glands the fight or flight glands in terms of the low level blood sugar imbalance in the morning she could be skyrocketing her cortisol or she could have it on a low end because once we've gotten past pushing ourselves too much to the limits we could flatline our cortisol so we don't even get that much cortisol coming out in the morning to wake us up and indeed that is the case with this patient she she's a flatliner as i call it she's in a really severe state of adrenal imbalance some folks call it adrenal fatigue my theory is that if you have a fatigued adrenal you're not going to be alive um so they still keep you alive but she's very she's pushed it to the limits it's not working like it should so yes i'm supporting her with adrenal gland support and in her case i'm giving a glandular which is a cow crushed up adrenal gland which is kind of crazy but it works to help to keep that gland healthy and support her so that's 35 years old and where this individual is at she's a lovely gal she she's amazing and very smart but she's not in a job that's challenging her and she's not having fun I really think that like half the problem of this stress component is not having fun okay so she's 35 now let's fast forward to my patient in her late 50s she's 56 years old and she cannot stay out of the ER she has incredible troubles breathing and it's a chronic asthma issue now she told me when she first came in to see me some four years ago that she had had a contact with mold while cleaning about 20 years prior to right now and she didn't know if that was her issue because she always had since then since that episode of cleaning issues with their lungs and being able to get a deep breath but not until now did it end her up in the er so 20 years ago remember how i said 20 to 30 years it takes for chronic disease to develop now this gal love her dearly but she's also a push 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 do 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 go 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 kind of gal and she loves to to be at social events she's super partier kind of gal um super social butterfly she's one of those people that uh suffers from fomo fear of missing out and in her late 50s that goes a long way she's got children she's got elder parents she's juggling them there's lots of stuff going on and so this particular patient now has gone to the point where if she can't stay at the er to keep getting breathing treatments what the heck do we do now um prior to that she had had a series of accidents so motor vehicle accidents in a row i don't know what it is about people but it seems like for some reason once someone has a pretty severe car accident it seems like multiple ones follow i do not know what that's about but i've seen it as a pattern and in this gal she's had multiple car accidents which have left her with different types of pain which has left her with not being able to be as physically active as she once was but she still gets out to her parties and her social events and she drinks quite a bit and we've talked about that over and over again and she's a stress eater and in this case is interesting because she first started feeling those lung issues when she was cleaning out a house with a friend 
And now she's gone to full on every week, almost every other week at this point, if not every week, has to be in the ER. That's crazy. She's had to take all kinds of steroids. She's had to take lots of antibiotics. Um, and I, I mean, natural medicine wise, I can keep her stable for a little while, but not very long. And so this is an advanced issue. And this is where I see the pattern going. And the reason I'm describing these two individuals is they're the ones that have been in my office most recently, but I see it over and over again. And it's something that scares me because I can see some of my late 20s to mid to late 30s folks who are like spinning images of some of my folks who are in their late 50s and 60s who are quite deconditioned um, and their cells are just dying slowly, really. It, it's, it's, it's sad. And in this case, when we look at the primary organ of, of issue, it's something to, to take into account. In Chinese medicine, the lungs are, yes, involved in breathing, but they're also involved in grief and being able to pull down your breathing qi. Now, what does that mean? Well, your lungs work with your kidneys in the Chinese world in terms of grounding you, stabilizing you, making you feel comfortable, if we put it that way. So having the lungs compromised is probably the worst thing that can happen in terms of your overall body balance. Now I've talked about adrenal exhaustion. This patient is completely in adrenal, having adrenal issues. In fact, she's gone as far as, she's so far low that we've actually had to work with medication to get her adrenal glands back and use hydrocortisone. Now, of course, that lowers the immune system. And she also has mycoplasma um, bacteria in her lungs. And we've worked on trying to get rid of the mycoplasma because I think that having a chronic fungal type of, or not fungal, a bacterial type of infection, that's a problem. That's a big problem. So having any type of infection, whether it's a virus, whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a fungus, whatever it may be, that is a big issue. If you can't get it under control. It's uh, devastating, actually. Um, it, it's going to reap havoc on your body. And I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say about it other than you got to work on knowing one if you have something like that that's weakening your, your body. If we go back to my patient that was 35, she is, she's got H. pylori which is a bug that's common for causing ulcers. It lives in our body um, naturally for a lot of people and doesn't really cause too much trouble. There's been debate as to whether we need to kill it off or what we need to do. But sometimes when folks have chronic gut issues, I'm always looking to see what kind of infection they have. So this stealth pathogen kind of concept, what might be underlying? Do I need to knock that down a little so that the body can move on, heal, and be able to have a strong enough immune system to move into whatever next comes at it. But with mycoplasma, this is a bacteria. I, I believe I said fungus at some point. Sorry about that. It's a bacteria. It goes after um, the lungs and lives in the lungs. And in, at this point, this scale, if we look at the emotional side of this, she's been grieving for a long time that she's never done what she wanted to do in life. She worked for her family's business because that's what you did. That's what you do when your family has a successful business. But she never really got to do what she wanted to do. And so, not to get all woo-woo, but the Chinese medicine stuff's kind of cool because if your lungs are what are attacked and the mycoplasma, you know, your body became, her body became susceptible to to it, it's interesting as to why certain illnesses lodge in certain areas. And in her case, it's, it's grief. And I really think that she's, you know, having some trouble with, with not being able to tell her family that she wanted to do something else and, and get that joy back in life too. 
So there is that woo-woo side of it, but there's also figuring out what virus, what bacteria, what fungus, what what's attacking that person's health. So if you look at the symptoms that you have right now and you're thinking, do I have any chronic illnesses? Do I have Lyme? Do I have, um, Lyme comes from a tick bite. Do I have, you know, herpes virus? Do I have human papillomavirus? So do you get chronic plantar warts? These kind of things can be a problem and eventually kind of be where your stress turns into immune compromise. So remember I said cortisol levels being up compromises your immune system. And if you have a particular virus that has a particular affinity for somewhere in the body, you might end up with some serious issues in that particular area. So thinking about warts, planners, warts, et cetera, those kind of things too. So just think about that there. All right, let's go back. So why are we thinking about disease 20 to 30 years ahead before it before it develops? Well, it's because we've got some cellular regulation stuff happening on happening that contributes to creating disease over time. So there is a molecule in the body, it's called NF kappa B. It is a master inflammation regulator. It determines how long a cell survives. So you can get an NF-kappa B going if you drink too much alcohol. And when I say too much alcohol, that's that's an interesting comment because we have this idea that one glass of wine a day is going to be so cardioprotective and great for our vessels and great for our health. But depending on how much you weigh and depending on how physically active you are, that one glass of wine might not be a good idea. In fact, I don't even recommend it at all because I'm seeing way too many gut issues with chronic yeast infections and gut irritation because folks are drinking too much wine. Now, it can be any alcohol, of course, but too much alcohol, I think, is one of the things that upregulates our inflammation regulator, the NF-kappa B. And I'm going along the lines for myself I'm about 130 pounds. I'm five foot two. I'm thinking that I probably shouldn't even be drinking more than once or twice a week at the most. And to be honest with you, I don't even drink anymore because it just doesn't even like me. I don't feel good. It's not worth it. So think about that. Now, the other thing is, is environmental stress. That's the thing sometimes that we can't control. If there's mold in our environment, if you've got planes flying over you, like here in Tacoma, if you've got, you know, car exhaust, whatever it may be. You can't control that, but you can work with spices and different foods to help counter that. Poor diet, you can control that, but some people just love their their junk foods, and that's going to keep inflammation going. The most inflammatory foods actually end up being the processed stuff, stuff that is not closest to nature. I've talked about that at nauseum here, but we can talk too about, you know, wheat, dairy, soy, corn, those guys, and sugar, the five big inflammatory foods. A lot of times, the nightshade family, the tomatoes, the eggplant, all those guys get demonized. But I'd rather have someone eating their vegetables and avoiding too much of our messed up wheat, too much dairy, our soy, the corn is so genetically modified it's messed up, and then sugar being a biggie. And I've talked about sugar. I've got a podcast all about it if you want more information on that. um, Go check that out. I talk all about how it affects your skin and your body in general. Smoking, vaping, I don't think vaping is any better. It seems like those oils in the vape stuff might even be worse than what's in a cigarette. So those things, keep in mind, those are going to keep inflammation going. It's going to keep the NF-kappa B levels elevated. Viruses, bacteria, funguses, those stealth pathogens I just talked about, those guys. If you've ever had monovirus, that is a problem. It's going to stay in your body, and boy, as soon as you start to get a little bit stressed out. It seems that that guy reaps its ugly head. I don't know why, but it's it's a little creature. Got a lot of folks with chronic reactivated mono in my practice. Then the other big thing is not getting enough exercise. And I'm not talking about killing yourself at the gym. I'm talking about just movement. Every person who is driven, it seems that there is this this drive to do, but they sit and do their work and won't get up from their chair for hours. I learned that the hard way. I have to get up and move and do things. I mean, at this point, my body screams at me because I'm getting stiff. But it's important to move. 
I don't know how many people go to the gym, like, get it on a serious workout, and then go sit all day. That does not help you. It's not good for you. It actually is, you might as well not even work out. So I'm recommending get up during the day. And I'm not talking a ton of time. I mean, just get up a couple minutes, walk around, just get your move on. So veggies, legumes, beans, fiber. These guys help to keep NF-kappa B, the master inflammation regulator, in check. And what it does is that those guys help to keep us from going on inflammatory rages in the body. They have high amounts of phytonutrients. These phytonutrients have antioxidants, and those guys help. And, and this antioxidant word for for me even seems like this imaginary, like really, what does that what does that mean? It means it clears out proteins in your body that your body creates that cause irritation. It helps like flushing the body out, just like a good radiator flush. And so most of us are not getting enough fiber to start with. We use coffee to poop, but if we didn't have coffee, would we be able to poop? How many out there listening to this right now have no idea if they stop coffee, if they would be able to poop or not? I challenge you to trying it because America's number one laxative is totally irritating to the gut. It rips your gut up. And if I can get people to stop drinking coffee, a lot of times I can get digestive issues to go away. Then you don't have to take supplements and you don't have to take medications. You just switch from coffee to green tea. And why do I say green tea? Green tea is a great tannin containing antioxidant having tea. It's a great component to help you with your body. Some folks recommend up to four cups a day. This Lee Carroll, who I went to his conference last week, and that's what he was saying, four cups a day of green tea. Kind of cool. Same thing along those lines. Four cups of tea keeps the doctor away. He was talking about green Granny Smith apples. The tannin component, because they're more tart, has a great phytonutrient. So phytonutrients are much like medicine in in our foods and spices and what they do is they help, like I said, to radiate or flush out the inflammatory proteins in the body. They just flush stuff out for you. Tannins are astringent. They kind of suck things and push things out. It's kind of cool. That's why wine is recommended. Wine has resveratrol, which is a high antioxidant um, component. But if you've ever been to wine tasting, there's all the people are always like, it has oaky undertones and a high tannin content. I don't know. I don't know if they'd even say that together. When people at wine tasting stuff start saying that stuff, my head spins. And I'm just like, I can only tell you if wine tastes good or bad. And I don't really care beyond that. I don't know about the specifics. I'm not a sommelier or however you say that word either. I can't say that one. Sorry to my friends that are sommeliers. I know I have some. (laughs) I'm a dork. All right. So if you go down the lines of fiber... There's some research that says that our caveman ancestors ate up to 100 grams of fiber a day. That's a ton of fiber. Most Americans don't even get 20 grams a day. Recommended in my universe, I'm trying to get folks to have 35 grams of fiber a day. How do we get that? You eat your veggies. And if you listen to any of my other podcasts, I'm always talking about six to eight cups of veggies a day. You go up to 10. In fact, I'm like hitting up the 10 right now because it's kind of fun to challenge yourself. But also, if you challenge yourself to eating more veggies, guess what? You won't eat snack food. Like if you hold yourself to it. Now I have all these folks who are driven, go, 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 do, do, do folks. I challenge you guys to eat your veggies like, like it's nobody's business. That's your job. That's your mission. Do that like you do your job, you're going to be a heck of a lot healthier. Now combine those veggies with some spices that are master regulators of cellular defenses and cellular stress. Now what's that? That's something called NRF2. This is a molecule that is in, or not that is in, that can be boosted with certain spices, such as turmeric, green tea, rosemary, ginkgo, resveratrol, echinacea, frankincense, granny smith apples, and garlic. Now, let's talk about turmeric, aka curcumin, for a minute. I think a lot of people think that curcumin is different than turmeric. It is not. Curcumin is turmeric. It's what you want from the turmeric. Now, 
depending on what type of curcumin you're getting in, you're going to get a different type of reaction. If you're taking turmeric powder or curcumin powder and you're throwing it into your smoothies, you're going to be de-inflaming your gut because that curcumin can't cross your gut barrier very well. It gets degraded by your gut bugs. But it's amazing for de-inflaming your gut lining. I use it in my smoothies to help me to calm down my gut, especially when I've ate something that doesn't settle so well. Now, there are other ways to get curcumin in, and there's something called BCM95. So it's an absorbable form of curcumin, and that's okay. It can help, um, but it's not the most effective way. We're finding that curcumin has to be either embedded in a liposomal phytosome. So now I'm totally geeking out on you with some big words. What that means is it gets embedded in a fatty molecule so that it can be sucked across the gut lining into your bloodstream. Now that's the type of curcumin, aka turmeric, that gets in and helps to de-inflame your joints and your muscles and your brain. Um, and it's pretty cool. I like it. It, it helps folks a lot, but you got to be taking the right time type to get some results. Now, there's one more type of turmeric that is kind of, well, there's two more. There's one of turmeric with pepper, but I don't like the turmeric and peppering combos because the pepper increases the sulfur pathway, and that can really cause some issues for folks. Some folks have mutations that is called CBS mutations. Sounds kind of crazy. It's not a TV channel, but the CBS mutation can actually cause these people to not be able to break down sulfur, so that's one issue. But it also can be irritating. And so some folks with that sulfur pathway, pepper, curcumin, if that's upregulated, they don't get the benefit from it. So that sucks. Now, turmeric forte is a product from MediHerb. It is, I believe, an Australian herbal company. And they have a combination of turmeric and fenugreek. And what happens is that fenugreek protects their curcuminoids, so these are the most active molecules of their curcumin, from being degraded by the gut bacteria. And then the sticky part of the fenugreek actually gets sticks to the gut lining and allows that molecule of turmeric to get across. So it's kind of an alternative to the embedded in the phytosome, so embedded in the fatty molecule, suck across liposomal curcumins. So if I've lost you yet, I want to gain you back. I'm sorry. I had to geek out there for a minute. Turmeric and the fresh uh, component to make curries and to make um, put in smoothies is amazing. Gives things a lovely yellow color, but it is going to work only on your gut. Keep that in mind. And if you have amazing gut bacteria, you might you know, get a great response in de-inflaming the gut lining. But if you want it for your joints and your muscles and you want to help it to prevent cellular aging, just like I've talked about, you want it to work on that NRF2, you want to slow down the aging process, you want to get either a liposomal form of curcumin and or you want to get turmeric forte by MediHerb because that technology is kind of cool too. And the cool part about turmeric forte, it's been studied to get in across the blood-brain barrier because a lot of us who have broken brains because we've stressed ourselves to the limits need to de-inflame the brain. A lot of us are walking around with inflamed brains. That's anxiety and depression right there, inflamed brains, but also guts inflamed. So if we can work on gut inflammation and brain inflammation, we can be a lot happier folks. So chew on that for a moment there with that turmeric. The other cool thing about turmeric is the great, the research lately has been showing that it can reduce C-reactive protein, which is a protein made by the liver to indicate that we've got a ton of inflammation happening um, on the vessel lining. And this is, this is local white blood cells are releasing inflammatory factor 6, IL-6. And this is the digestive system can release this, so blood vessels can release this, but also this can be released anywhere that there's an inflammatory reaction going on. So the higher the C-reactive protein, the more IL-6, inflammatory 6, is in the system. It basically tells you that there's damaged cells in the body, that you are slowly damaging some part of your body. My gal that I talked about who can't stay out of the ER, her C-reactive protein is 16 and, and it should be zero or one at the very least. She has 16. That's huge. So the more CRP you have floating around, the more damage cells you have. So that's not a good thing. But if you want to know how inflamed your body is, you want to ask your doctor to go and test that for you. It's a blood test. 
and it can be run along with lipids so along with cholesterol because that's a it's a good marker that I use to see where people are at in the inflamed state now the combination of turmeric and berberines berberines come from golden seal and other and other herbs um, it helps with diabetes and it works on microcirculation. It helps to really help that pancreas to reestablish function, but also helps on the gut lining because berberines are a regulator of gut balance. So berberines and turmeric, big deal there. Use those together if you know anyone has diabetes or is pre-diabetic. That's a huge thing there. The other cool thing that turmeric can do is it can reduce triglycerides. I often see triglycerides elevated when folks are stressed out. Because what's happening is they're on full mode to either store fat um, or store carbs as fat. And it goes hand in hand really with folks who have higher levels of blood sugar, so glucose, in the bloodstream for long periods of time. So something really cool there. So garlic. Really cool component here. I guess cool is the word of the day. Um, Garlic. Is, is interesting. You've probably seen garlic. It's got the outside of the clove and then it's got that core on the inside. So the allen and allanase, these are two co- components of garlic, meaning allen in the outside of the, the clove of the garlic, kind of that white part. And then that greenish kind of part in the core um, has allanase. And when you crush those suckers together, you make allicin, which is an amazing bomb in the gut to really regulate blood flow. And most of us, Part of the issue with with our health is that we don't have proper blood flow. We don't have the microcirculation happening that we need to to help to keep our body healthy. Why is that happening? Well, if you're stuck in fight or flight mode, you've got blood in your legs and arms, but not in your gut most of the time. You're literally trying to run away from bears. So where do you need your blood? Obviously in the periphery. But a lot of times, some of us don't get blood to our hands or feet. So our hands and feet are cold. Our butt's cold. The, the tissue that we're carrying around, feel your belly, feel your, feel your back. A lot of times they're cold. And that means we don't have a lot of circulation happening to those areas, especially if they're fattier. If you have cellulite, your body's forgot about those areas. That's just like storage. That's your storage container. If you've ever had a storage container, which most people I swear, like they'll get a storage container and forget that their stuff's in the storage container. And they might go back once every few years. They just keep paying on it. It's that. That's what your fat is. Your body forgot about that stuff. You need circulation to help to clear that crap out. All right. So talking about garlic. Boswellia. Boswellia is frankincense. It is amazing in terms of an herb to shut down the response that leads to degrading of cartilage. So anybody who is an athlete, but anyone who's having aches or pains in the joints, Boswellia especially as you start to get older. I think of it as one of my aging spices slash essential oils slash herbs that I need in my life all the time. It's great topically for aches and pains, but I like it even better internally. So frankincense, aka boswellia, amazing component. Boswellia complex by MediHerb is one of my favorite ones to use. I do not get any money from MediHerb by saying this. I just like the stuff, so I'm telling you. That's that's where it is. So echinacea. Let's talk about echinacea for a minute because I think echinacea is super cool and overlooked often as a, a useful herb that has great phytonutrient components, especially because it works well with CBD oil. It works just like THC, but doesn't give you that high. And so what I've been finding is for a lot of folks that don't want the THC high, but want to get the pain relief with CBD oil, I add echinacea in. And so what it does is it prolongs CBD oil effects. And so how does it work? Well, echinacea has an ability to work with cannabinoid receptors. And interestingly enough, the CB2 cannabinoid receptors regulate immune function. What does echinacea do? It is a great immune system regulator. It's gotten a bad rap because a lot, someone some 10 years ago said that echinacea is not good for folks with autoimmune conditions and we don't know what it's going to upregulate. But the, the sad reality is, is that person who, who put that information out was incorrect. Echinacea is amazing. It, it regulates the productions of fatty acids that we need to calm ourselves. It works on, on really calming the stress reaction. But my favorite part is that it can also help with pain. And so consider taking some echinacea purpura with your CBD oil and see if it works for you. Try it out. 
Try a liquid form, then you can figure out what your right dosing is. Now, oregano, anise, thyme, those guys kill yeast and parasites. Awesome stuff. So throwing that in your food all the time, amazing. And it's easy to throw this stuff in. You can use dried, you can use fresh. It doesn't matter. I just recommend making sure it's organic. I like fresh a little bit better because it gives a little, I don't know, it just gives a good flavor profile when it's fresh. But anyway, you can get it in. Think about adding spices all the time to your food. Myrrh. Myrrh is great for parasites. These these worms that get into the body, in particular, um, like hel- little helminths, like the pinworms and things of that nature, they increase something called IL-4, which means that or sorry, they don't increase, they decrease IL-4, and they they can hide from the immune system. That's why it's hard to find if someone has parasites. But myrrh actually increases the IL-4 and brings them out of their shells. And so giardia, things like that, this is common in Colorado for dogs and folks to get giardia. Myrrh can help with that. I actually would think that it would be great for anyone going on a long backpacking trip to have a little myrrh daily. Anyone going to India should take myrrh all the time. That's where I see people coming back with parasites. Mexico too. Things of that nature. Any third world country, take myrrh on a low level daily to uh, keep things away. Now, one thing I would say, low level, da- low level daily cycle it though. Myrrh can be a little bit strong. So like four days on, five days off, four days on, 10 days off, something like that. Cycle it, see what your gut does. But it is helpful to keep parasites away. Wormwood, artemisia. It is probably one of the number one used herbs in China. We use it a lot in Chinese medicine and it's antimicrobial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory. It kills parasites, it kills yeast, and it has this interesting chemical component called a peroxide bridge, which all of us geeky folks geek out on because that's unique and it actually works to kill things um, that live in, in your gut quite nicely. And so artemisia, otherwise known as wormwood, a great spice to help out in that department. Now, digestive bitters, a lot of people have heard of digestive bitters. They're kind of trendy. Um, it's what Jaeger used to be before we turned it into Jaeger bombs. Beharovka, another type of drink that is in the Czech Republic. These are a combination of herbs. And in particular, most of them have something called golden seal in it. And it can help with clearing bile from the gallbladder to help with you, you digesting, but also help to prevent gallbladder stones and blockages so considering some digestive bitters just getting yourself not some some jaeger but there's something called organic um i forget what they're called they're in a bottle Uh uh-oh um i'll have to put that in my resources page on my website so that war it'll be on my chart it won't be there it'll be my notes um my podcast notes on my website at drjkrausnd.com i'll put it there but digestive bitters great stuff i take something called digestive Digest Forte from Medi Herb, which are in a tablet form of bitters, not a liquid, but there are liquid ones that you can take. Berberines for diabetes are a form of digestive bitters. Globe artichokes and beets. I've talked about those guys before. Those guys help you poop because they're working on clearing gallbladder sludge. And those guys are amazing. And you can take a globe artichoke liquid supplement from Medi Herb, or you could just eat a whole bunch of gar- globe artichokes. And like one one every couple days, you know, just throwing in some artichokes whenever you can into your diet. Throw it on salads, make, you know, chicken dishes with it. It's amazing because um, it just makes it easier to, to move that mucus because our, our gallbladder has mucus in it. And the more mucus that's in that gallbladder, the more it's easier to bind with cholesterol and make stones. But if you can just keep it cleared out, boom. No gallstones. Beets also help with pushing out stuff from the gallbladder too. So consider beets in that department. Cedar. Cedar trees. Now, usually we're not going to use that as a spice to eat, but it's a great herb to use to kill viruses. Thuya is the fancy term for that. I will use thuya oil for topically for planters' warts, but also internally. Licorice root. Licorice root is interesting. Um, We use it often as tea. It's a base in a lot of different things, but it affects the receptors that bind cortisol and can help with your response to stress. And 
Yes, it can raise blood pressure in some folks who already have elevated blood pressure. So if you already have elevated blood pressure at this point, I'd say licorice probably isn't the best thing for you. But if you don't, it might be something to consider, especially even if you have lower blood pressure and you're stressed out, to help with the stress reaction. And so I have folks drinking green and licorice tea together during the day to just help with stress management. Holy basil, another amazing herb that is great in that combo too. So sometimes I'll make people a combination of green tea, holy basil, and licorice root, and that's their their daily stress management protocol. All right, so I went through a whole bunch of herbs and just kind of listed them off. And really the idea here is just to get you thinking about how you can use certain herbs and spices to help with managing stress and kind of adding them into your life, and also managing your infections and illness if you have any of these. So thinking about it in a logistical pattern as to how do you really work with this? How do you keep yourself healthy for life so that stress doesn't kill you? Well, first you want to think about what's going on with your tissue issues. The skin is our biggest protector, but a lot of us have tissue issues. Do you have acne? Do you have eczema? Do you have psoriasis? Do you have rashes that just randomly show up? Do you have gut issues? Do you have nose issues? Do you have vaginal issues? So thinking about your tissues in general, any gut dysbiosis or skin dysbiosis, meaning bug imbalance, can set you up for a stress-induced illness when you get older. So the best way is to work on circulation and the best way to work is on balance via diet. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's microcirculation. I've talked about oregano, basil, rosemary, getting those spices in on a daily basis to help for circulation. Go to cola is a herb that can be amazing for helping with circulation. MediHerb has a product for that too. Um, And you can find it other places, but go to cola is one of my favorites for circulation in addition to ginkgo. Of course, diet for your gut always. Getting in fiber, trying to get 35 grams of fiber or more. That's 68 veggies a day. If you want to be like me, challenge yourself to 10 and see how that goes, just for fun. Now, the other big thing is killing off any persistent illnesses or viruses or bacteria. Huge there. If you've got any of that going on, you want to work on that. Now, the other biggie is protecting and vitalizing your cells. You want to keep those cells strong mentioned circulation with go-to cola in ginkgo, but also omega-3 fatty acids help to revitalize your cells. Hawthorne berry revitalizes cells. Ginkgo, resveratrol, whey. Whey protein does. If you do not have an issue with whey protein, I highly recommend using it to help to stimulate your cells and get them to be nice and strong. So the next big thing to think about to avoid issues as you age is making sure you're regularly detoxifying. I have folks doing a detox every two, twice a year, spring and fall, and I have a whole podcast on are you healthy enough to, pod, to, to podcast? Are you healthy enough to podcast? I don't know. Am I healthy enough to podcast today? Um, but are you healthy enough to detox? And so that's my previous podcast. Check that out if you're wondering about that. But on a daily basis, turmeric's great for that. Milk thistle, like I mentioned before, artichoke, beets. Those guys are amazing. Green tea, great daily kind of detoxifiers just to help to reduce the NRF, or sorry, to increase NRF2 and reduce NF-kappa-B effects in your body. Remember those molecules I talked about earlier? You do not want too high of NF-kappa-B. You want to boost NRF2 so that you reduce inflammation. So garlic, grape seed extract, those kind of things are going to help with detoxifying your body. The next one is enhancing sleep. you got to work on the sleep. If you struggle with sleep, you got to try some herbs at night to see if you can boost your ability to sleep. My favorite for sleep is a combination of chamomile and passion flower. It has a little 5-HTP in it. It's called Insomnitol by Designs for Health. That's one of my faves. But you, there's a variety of things out there that can help with sleep. Shisandra berry, ashwagandha, romania can be extremely useful. There's a a product called Romania Complex by Mediherb that's useful too to help with enhancing sleep. Rolora, so this is philodendron bark and magnolia bark. Those two are great. Holy basil can help with sleep. So take a look at those. Now, the next big thing is getting rid of your gut bugs. 
I use oregano on a daily basis with certain, depending on what I'm making, I just throw some oregano in there. Oregano oil, the essential oil daily can help with dysbiosis, echinacea daily. You could throw echinacea into a tea and make a nice green tea combo as well. Rosemary, also helpful in this case. I mentioned myrrh. Myrrh is something that you want to cycle on. You don't want to be on every single day. But those are helpful. Anise oil, super helpful for eliminating dysbiosis. And interestingly enough, just to divert for a second, think about all of the different foods we have and why they're spiced certain ways. Most likely it was created because people felt better taking those over time. Just something to think about. So thinking about anise, anise is popular in Italian dishes and it's a great flavor, but I wonder if um, some of the old folks maybe were working on how good you felt after having anise um, in, in the foods. I don't know, something to think about. Now, obviously optimizing digestion in addition to getting rid of the dysbiosis is key. So the bitters, the ginger, the globe artichoke, milk thistle, beetroot, licorice, golden seal, all things to help to optimize digestion. The other biggie is optimizing immune function. I highly recommend Siberian ginseng, otherwise known as Eleuthero. Astragalus, Chinese herb, great for boosting the immune system. Echinacea is already mentioned in Wormwood. Those are my four faves for optimizing immune function. And then enhancing support of your tissues, just kind of working on that gastric barrier, collagen. I'm a huge fan of L-glutamine, an amino acid that's fuel for the gut cells, and collagen. I think they're amazing to help to keep that gut lining strong. And I love licorice for helping to support the gut lining barrier. It kind of helps with mucus protection, kind of puts a band-aid on those new turning over cells. And ginger. Ginger is a great warming digestive stimulant that is detoxifying at the same time. Now, That is a big old long list and I've just spewed at you all of that. Don't worry, you don't have to take any notes. I have that in my podcast notes at docjkrausnd.com. So I've went through a lot of stuff. This has been a long podcast, but I hope that it helps you to start thinking about your health proactively and take some steps to really regulate your body's function, get your body nice and healthy so that you don't end up with chronic illnesses related to stress, basically caused by stress that could kill you as kill you quicker as you get older. You want to age gracefully, not quickly. And so you have survived another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krauss. Go out and enjoy your day, whatever you're doing. Thanks for tuning in to The Health Fix, the podcast all about taking control of your health, rebelling against aging, and having fun every day. A lot of patients ask me, Do you think I'm aging too fast? So, I created an evaluation checklist for you to see for yourself. Plus, I created a resource guide to help you slow down the aging process right now. You can find it for free on my website, drjkrausnd.com. If you like this podcast, help get the word out to others by liking it and rating it. If you'd like more natural health tips and want to join our Facebook community where I interact daily, Click on the Join Group button on our website at drjkrausnd.com.